Hello, today is June 30th, 2009. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. And we are privileged to, today to have with us Guy A. Schrag. Welcome, Guy. Thank you for coming. Thank you. How are you? Very good, thanks. Good. May I ask you when and where you were born? Uh, 1st of October, 1921, in South Edmiston, New York. And where do you currently live? In uh, Natick. And your marital status? I'm a widower. Do you have children? Yes, I have uh, three. Well, I have two sons and a daughter by my marriage to uh, the widow who gave me two wonderful stepdaughters. Uh, so I have what I consider five. Five children. And how about grandchildren? Oh, I have quite a few of those. And great-grandchildren, too. My goodness. Yes. And did you grow up in New York? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you graduate from high school? Yes. Salve, New York, is a, a, my home school. Right close to Syracuse. Okay. Mm -hmm. And where and when did you enter the military? Well, I enlisted in Buffalo, New York uh, in the summer of 1942, July of 42. Uh, but I was called to active duty in February of 43, 27th of February 43. And why did you join at that time? Well, I uh, wanted to to be in the service, and I wanted to be in the Air Force. And I also had been told that uh, I could uh, receive a college deferment to finish my college. Were you in college at that time? Yes. Uh -huh. Where were you attending college? At the State University of New York College of Forestry at Syracuse University. And what year were you in when you uh, enlisted? Well, I was completing my junior year, although I hadn't completed it. Incidentally, they let me take final exams and gave me passing grades if I did good enough on and uh, you did. which were So I could pretty much uh, complete my junior, or get credit for completing my junior year, even though I, I wasn't there, uh, which is a nice break. And when you mentioned the Air Force, back then it was the Army Air Force? Army Air Corps, I, Army. I guess they call it, uh, yeah. And why did you decide you wanted to be in the Air Corps or the Air Force? Well, there's just something romantic about flying, and uh, I love the idea of it. I like the, the type of aircraft that the Army had. And back then, what was that? Well, they had P-40s that the Flying Tigers were using. And they had uh, well, the P-38 Lightning and the P-47 Thunderbolt. And eventually they got the P-51 Fighters. And of course, in the bomb bombers, they had the Flying Fortress B-17s, which is my, my aircraft. You can see it one right here. <laughs> is that the B-17? <laughs> yeah, that's one sure. of the B-17s. Okay. Replica. Did family or friends join the service no, when you were joined? Just you. No, just me. And where were you? You were you were able to defer, so you could continue college for a little bit. Yeah. And then you went in in February of yeah. '43. Yeah. Where did you go for your basic training? Atlantic City, New Jersey. And had you been there before? I'd been there on a. a let's see, you know, had I been there then? I went there afterwards. I think I had been there once before. Mm -hmm. And yes. where in Atlantic City did you go to basic training? Uh, well, it was a, a former hotel. They oh. commandeered the hotels to use for uh, uh, housing the troops. I can't remember the name of that hotel, but it was an old one. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we had to scrub the floors with <laughs> brushes and <laughs> make everything look uh, that's so ridiculous. that's not an exaggeration when they said that you used brushes and toothbrushes? Almost, or, almost yeah. yeah. And the bed had to be just, just so tight and so forth. 
And what else was it like? What did you like and dislike about basic training? Well, I loved the camaraderie, and I loved learning about new things, and the feeling that I was about to do my part. I liked the exercise and the singing, and uh, let's see, I, I had jotted down something else I liked, but I, <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. Oh, well, I, well, the dislikes, and I hated the idea of having to uh, wear a gas, pa gas mask pack and raincoat most every place we went. We did an awful lot of marching uh, on that boardwalk back and forth to the mess halls. And uh, we also had to cope with this idea that everything had to be just so. Your bed had to be tight and your uh, floors polished. And So coping with the rules sometimes yeah, was tiring was, for you? Everything was planned for us and structured. Uh, How long were you in basic training? Oh, I think... Uh, about uh, two months, mm -hmm. I believe it was. And where did you go from there? Well, from there, I went to a, a lot of different bases. I went to, to a, uh aviation school up in uh, Norwich University in Northville, Vermont. Uh, they gave us a test to see what we might be a little bit weak in. And uh, I came up with geography and biology, I think, <laughs> which were not very much, <laughs> much needed in the military. Sure. Because uh, I had had a lot of science and math and so forth. And that's the first place I went after basic. And I loved it up there. I, uh, I really got myself in good physical shape up there. Now, when you talk about aviation school, was this learning the ins and outs of the airplane itself? No. What was it? It was primarily, you know, it almost seems though they might have used it because they were overflowing in the, the next step that we were supposed to go in. Uh, I, I, I enjoyed learning history, which I should have learned in high school, mm -hmm. <laughs> biology. And some of, the, some of the people, of course, were, were given training that they needed in math and so forth. Uh, but primarily, we were given uh, arduous physical activity. And that's where I got to be uh, uh, in very good physical shape. I would do thousands of sit-ups at night after lights were out. And uh, I also uh, oh, learned, oh, did cross-country runs and uh, learned some more about military uh, protocol and activities. But, oh yes, and while we were there, we were given a foretaste of a flying training with the Piper Cubs uh, at a nearby air base. And I enjoyed that. Had you flown before this time? Just one flight that my mother took me, put me on. As, as a passenger, you mean? Or, passenger, okay. oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So after the aviation training through Norwich, uh, where did you go? Did you have any other additional specialized Yes, yeah, so we went training? to a classification center uh, where we were, let's see, did we go there first? Yeah, we went there first. And they gave us tests and interviews and so forth to categorize us as to what field we were going to be put into. Uh, we, we, were, became, we became aviation cadets after we left that uh, uh, old college training detachment at Norwich and uh, had uniforms and cadet wings. And then we were sent to a pre-flight school at Maxwell Field, Alabama. Had Where? that been the first time you were that far south? Yes, it was. What was that like for you, being in it a was different great. part of the country? That was great. What Thank do you remember about it? Well, oh, with the exception that at Nashville, it was too hot. Uh, we, had, we wore our fatigues, and uh, we only had two pairs of fatigues, and they would be wet and smelly <laughs> by before afternoon. and. We'd go to the, in the shower, and some fellow people would stay in the shower uh, all afternoon, staying cool. But I would uh, not waste that much time. Uh, but we, we didn't have much activity to uh, bother us at that uh, classification center. Had a lot of free time. And at Maxwell, 
I had enough free time so I could practice diving at the pool that they had, and uh, I acquired. Uh, and where was Maxwell Field again? Maxwell Field's in Alabama. Let's see now. What was? I can't think of the city that that's. That's okay. Yeah. Nashville was where the classification was. That was Tennessee. Maxwell Field. And so, uh, when you were classified, and you said you were an aviation cadet, yeah. once you got to Max. Maxwell well, field. field. What was your day like? What did you do there? Oh, we did a lot of pre-flight training. We we studied meteorology and uh, uh, oh gosh. Uh, do you remember how long you were there for? I th it seems like about a couple a month or so. I know we we had a lot of fun there. <laughs> did you get to see any sights down in that area at all on your free time, or did you have any free time? I had that time to go diving and uh, fooling around. Now, when you talk about diving, was that something it's that... It's a pool. Did you excel in diving? Not excel. I never excelled. But I had a lot of fun, and I learned to do some things, yeah. which I uh, augmented later on at another base. Okay. Uh, with a, when I had become a commissioned. So after Maxwell Field, you said you were there for a, a bit of time. Then, yeah. then where did they send you? Then they sent me to several different fields, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and Lincoln, Nebraska. And boy, I, I had more good times during those sojourns. Uh, and at each base, were you learning something new? Yes, I was learning a little something new, but it, it just seems all the, I can't remember just what we were doing, except for the good times. And I guess they were getting ready to, to assemble us as a crew. And they finally did uh, ship me down to El Paso, Texas, to join with uh, the members who would be our uh, Flight crew. And what was your specialty on the flight crew? A uh, navigator. So were, you were learning navigational things at these other bases also? Oh, yeah, and I forgot. There's one thing I, I did. To, to be a navigator, you also had to be a gunner. We, we had the, 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 the nose guns. So I went to gunnery school at, uh, oh, gosh, Fort Myers, Florida. And then to a, oh, wait a minute. I'm getting ahead of myself now. What am I? Uh, this uh, anachronistic is uh, what, must, what is happening to me here. Hmm. Let's see. But uh, you know, you don't have to have it in an exact order. But oh, you did go to gunnery school, so you had yeah. to learn how to utilize the guns that would be yeah. on the planes. Machine guns. The machine and then guns. I went to navigation school. Yeah, I forgot that. That's that's the important part of it. Uh, Salmon Field. Monroe, Louisiana, to navigation school. And tell us about navigation school. Uh, nowadays, it's a little more technical, I'm sure, but back yeah. then, because this was back in World War II, mm -hmm. um, th was there radar for you to learn? Not for us to use. Okay. No. We, used, we learned the, the series of, uh, of uh, techniques that uh, we would be using uh, even if we were going to go to uh, the, the uh, South Pacific. Uh, but we started out learning pilotage, which was navigation by reference to landmarks on the ground, which was fine if you could see the ground. Uh, and then we learned dead reckoning, which depended upon uh, compass uh, headings corrected for uh, navigation, uh, compass errors and uh, what is the other thing now that uh, the compass doesn't point to the North Pole, it points to the magnetic pole? Magnetic field. Can't think of the word. That's all right. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, that's dead reckoning and how to calculate the effect of the winds because the wind is the big variable in uh, aerial navigation. And uh, then we learned uh, celestial navigation, uh, shooting uh, 
uh, line of positions uh, at stars and at the sun to get uh, our positions and how to calculate our fixes and how to calculate the, the wind to use for a navigation. You see, as you're flying, if the wind is blowing you one way or the other, it's going to take you well off the course from which you're heading. And of course, it will also slow you down a lot if, you're, if it's a headwind or speed you up if it's a tailwind. So those things all had to be taken into account for navigation. And uh, uh, we learned how to uh, use those things. Oh yes, and we learned some other techniques uh, called pressure. No, that was later on we learned that. Pressure pattern didn't come into effect at that, <laughs> that stage. <laughs> that was in the reserves. So once you learned all of this navigation mm -hmm. studies, and then you said you went to El Paso, Texas to join the flight crew f f at some point. Yeah. Do you remember when that was? You said you active duty was February of 43. Do you know yeah. approximately when you went to Texas to join your flight crew? Uh, let's see now. Uh, it was in, I graduated from flight school, navigation school, in August of 1944. And from navigation school. Yeah, Selman Field. And then we, uh, we were shipped around to various bases after that. Well, yes, we were given a 14-day leave, I think, too, mm -hmm. after we graduated. We went home and uh, bought our uniforms and so forth because we were commissioned. At the same time we were made navigators, we were also commissioned as officers. And so what was your commission? Second Lieut lieutenant. Second lieutenant. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so you had some time off to come home. Yeah, and I, what a time I had. <laughs> uh, that's where I, oh, I, I used some of that comic dive uh, that I learned at uh, Maxwell and, and also uh, other bases to show off. <laughs> show off. <laughs> Green Lake uh, at, uh, with my buddy who was uh, uh, also from Syracuse. And uh, oh, what, a, what a time we had. Now, at that time, were you single? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you had about a two-week leave. Yeah. And did you go back to Texas at that point? No, I hadn't been to Texas yet oh, then. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, this was after after graduating from Monroe. Okay. Then we went to this series of bases, the Sioux Falls and Lincoln, Nebraska, and so forth, that I followed up and trying to tell you. That's okay. <laughs> and, uh, and then we were sent to Texas to become part of the crew. What and was Texas like? It was great also. Uh, oh, we, uh, we what, was the, what was the atmosphere like? What was, what was happening? What was, what was the weather like? What were the people like? Because you were from Syracuse, very different type of yeah. location. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. Uh, we, we loved the people. Uh, I love this, 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 uh, the Southern dialect and some of the fellows that uh, I became good friends with, Johnny Runyon saying, you like to run me over. <laughs> you couldn't have it. <laughs> <laughs> and also, we, we did uh, training flights in, the, in B-17s uh, down there with our crews uh, and uh, so got to this, know each other. That's what I was going to say. So at this point, you were actually able to establish a bond with your crew. Yeah. And how many were on the crew, I usually? Well, I think there were 10 of us. So mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we got one more when we became a lead crew. We got a radio operator. But I, I could count them off, but it's not, it's not that important, right. is it? Uh, but we did learn how to uh, get along with each other. And uh, I liked the pilot and co-pilot. And I could tolerate the bombardier. <laughs> I like the, the enlisted men, too. And also, uh, we had quite a bit of free time and had a lot of fun in El Paso. I remember at the Five Points Bowling Alley. Oh, uh, we had a lot of memorable experiences. Uh, one of them was a humorous experience, which I, I don't want to belabor this too long. That's OK. May, maybe if we have extra time, I might tell you that about Well, you that. could tell it right now if you'd like. Well, uh, Jack and I and another friend had, had co coaxed three, no, four 
young ladies to join us at our table. They were with other people, but we were doing fine and getting along good and looking forward to, to fun. Uh, but one of the young ladies, a little more sophisticated than the others, uh, decided to recite uh, the ribald classic uh, Ode to Moby Dick, which, of course, which I can't say here. But the other three girls were less sophisticated and were shocked. And within a very short interval, they excused themselves and, and bid us goodbye. And uh, so <laughs> because of this, this kind of a wild girl, and so the party's over. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was funny the way these girls' eyes got wide when. <laughs> While you were in training, were you hearing anything about what was going on elsewhere in the world? With yes, and to the I war? worried about that I might not get over there to get to participate in the activities. I wanted to be part of it, and uh, I didn't like this being sent from base to base for no real reason that I could see. And things seem to be going pretty well for us, at least those encouraging things. Such uh, as what, do you remember? Such as the battle at, battles at Guadalcanal and Midway and so forth that we heard about, and uh, the uh, bombing raids in the European theater, even though they were suffering horrific losses. It sounded as though we were chewing them up a little bit. And while you were in training with your crew, was there any inclination from the powers that be when you might be going over? Uh, no, I don't remember that we were given much of a, of a uh, forecast on that. It didn't take too long after we uh, uh, got our training at, uh, at uh, El Paso before we were uh, shipped to uh, uh, New Jersey and sent over. So uh, You were sent over from New Jersey? Yeah, Kilm Camp Kilmer. And how did you get over there? By ship? A um, ship, yeah. Uh, do you remember that trip at all? I do. It was a tremendous ship. And uh, being over mature, I can't think of the name of it now. The ship that overturned and burned, I think, big liner, former liner. And I remember that uh, uh, the officers' quarters weren't bad, uh, but the seas were kind of rough. And one thing that began to bother me was seeing a light swinging back and forth and <laughs> began to feel kind of woozy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I also remember being uh, assigned to go down into the enlisted men's quarters and, and maintain order down there. They didn't have it so good. They had berths and uh, hammocks, as I recall really call it, crowded and... Uh, In interviewing some others that were going overseas by ship, many of them said when they could they would sleep up on deck. Did you see that happen a lot? or? I don't think I ever slept out there, but I spent quite a bit of time out there. Mm -hmm. I love to look at the ocean, and mm -hmm. it seems an awful way down. <laughs> and where were you going? We were going to Scott. Well, we didn't know exactly. They didn't tell us that, but we were heading for uh, Great Britain someplace. We did go to uh, Prestwick, Scotland. I That's where you... Prestwick. Or was it Stowe? It was Scotland anyway. One place going over in Scotland, one place coming back to Scotland. And where was your base? Was it in Scotland? That was in England. In England. Yeah. And what was the name of the base? Do you Deer remember? from Green. I'll spell that for you. If you like D E O P H A M, Deer from, and then Green was G R E E N, and it may have had an E in the end to near Attleboro, in England. And it, was it an Army Air Corps base or a well, little bit of everybody? It became a, an Army Air Corps base, yes. Uh, Once you were there, were you able to see any of the devastation that had occurred prior to your arrival? No. Okay. No, I saw that on leave uh, in, in London, and that's about all that I saw. 
and it when actually you, was not anything anyway near. What, you weren't near it, imagine. okay. It wasn't, and, it wasn't as as uh, per, as bad as as people are led to believe. What about England, London itself? That's what I mean in oh, London. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there were some buildings. Of course, it looked real bad where the bombs hit, right. and where the V twos and so forth hit. But uh, areas where you went weren't well, quite that was as on bad. Leave. Right. Yeah. Uh, now, once you settled at Diffin Green, uh, what was your daily routine? Well, we were still uh, continuing with our training, mm -hmm. and uh, we uh, did training flights and uh, uh, got uh, briefed on uh, what our duties were in combat and how to use the equipment that they had on those 17s. And uh, we had quite a bit of free time. Uh, but it was exciting and uh, exhilarating to uh, especially to go on our first missions. Tell us about your first missions. Well, uh, they were uh, not enjoyable. E even though, uh, as a navigator, we didn't have the responsibility to actually direct the flight at that stage. Uh, we would fly in formations. And so we would naturally that the, the people who were responsible for going where they were supposed to go were the lead navigators. And uh, I used to oh, look with envy at uh, the lead navigators when they would come in and they would be reserved a special table for their charts and their, they'd have their charts pre-drawn pre for them sometimes. And uh, on the mission itself, uh, that was kind of rough. I still did the navigation because if we got separated from the formation, then it was my responsibility to get us to where we were supposed to do to, to drop our bombs if possible or to drop them on some target of opportunity or secondary target. It was also my responsibility to get them back if we got out of the formation or disabled. So I worked hard. And it was very difficult because it was cold, you know, 60 degrees below zero Fahrenheit at, at 25,000 feet. And what time of year was this now? Well, this was in, let's see now, uh, my memory is just February. 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 But it didn't matter what time of year no, because it was you were the up high, that made it the was difference. the altitude. Yeah. So what and kind of equipment did you wear? That's the problem. We had good... Uh, Warm boots and uh, leather jackets, electric heated clothes, and we had uh, uh, flak jackets and flak helmets, which I didn't have time to put on. They're too heavy and too cumbersome. I was too busy doing navigation, so I would sit on my flak, flak jacket and helmet. And also, to do navigation, I couldn't do it with my electric heated gloves on to handle the E6B computer and the dividers and the plotter and the charts and uh, uh, record the data. I had to take my gloves off and my hands would get so cold I couldn't do anything. I'd put the gloves back on and then uh, try to, to do what I could but then take them off again and and keep up getting my fixes and calculating my winds and my uh, headings and so forth that, uh, that I would need. So that was, was not fun. And then, of course, is the experience of, uh, of uh, seeing out the nose of the craft those black puffs ahead of us uh, that were the flak explosions of the anti-aircraft. From and the enemy. Knowing that we had to go to the initial point and we had to head towards that. that and where black. might that point be? Where might you have been heading to? Well, we'd be heading towards an initial point. Well, maybe I should clue you in. 
uh, to do these missions, we would fly zigzag patterns. They would pre-plan on the flight plan, flying to various places, which would avoid uh, anti-aircraft concentrations. You would avoid large cities and places where the Germans might expect that we would come. And so we would t fly a series of different headings uh, to uh, avoid this anti-aircraft. We would experience some, but it would be relatively light. You'd feel uh, the uh, aircraft bump sometimes. Now, where would you be hitting? What, what cities do you remember that you were oh, uh, assigned to go to? Uh, there were quite a few. Ulm, ULM was one, and Fonda, and we never, I think we never, we were never assigned to go to Berlin, but uh, we were assigned to uh, a lot of marshalling yards, uh, concentrations of big uh, uh, railroad depots. Now, would they be in Germany? Or, yeah, Germany. Okay, yes. In Germany. How, yeah. how long a flight was it? My assumption here is you're flying out of the um, Scot out of England. England. How long a flight to get to your destination? Do you remember? Well, yes. Uh, uh, quite a bit of time was spent in uh, in getting the group up together and assembled. Yeah. We would fly uh, around, around and around our radio buncher at our base, and. Uh, that became particularly important after we became a lead crew to get uh, all the, uh, the uh, other squadrons behind us assembled and then to fly to a series of other bases to join up with other groups to form a wing and then to, form, to fly to still other bases to assemble that wing into divisions and then to head across from England towards, towards France and into Germany. So that took probably about an hour. And then the missions itself would take, oh, six to eight hours, as I remember, usually, round trip. And when you talk about the division, you know, in, in picking up all these other... Um, wings. Wings. Yeah. At the end, how many might be in this group? Thousands. Really? Yeah. Uh, especially if we had maximum efforts. Uh, this will be a little anachronistic to talk about this, but during the Battle of the Bulge, they couldn't fly air support because of the bad weather for a couple of weeks. And the Allied forces suffered serious uh, setbacks because the Germans massed a big offensive and pushed our line back. We lost a lot of territory and a lot of uh, uh, soldiers, and we couldn't help them because uh, there was there was socked in. You couldn't drop bombs where you're not sure whether you're dropping them. Socked in by fog. By yeah, weather. Weather. So when the weather cleared enough to go, then they had a maximum effort, and so they would get these old B-17s that uh, were <laughs> decrepit and battle damaged, and and put those up. In Did you have to, to fly in any of those? I didn't get the worst ones, but uh, some of the crews that hadn't flown much uh, because of uh, oh, uh, some uh, oh, problem with their crew members. Either, either some people got oh, psy psychotic uh, problems from combat. And uh, like the, the pilot of the crew that roomed with us, had that problem. He, he couldn't fly anymore. And so... And was, that, was it because he had a lot of close calls or that he... I, I don't know. Or worried about his responsibilities. That was my biggest worry when we became a lead crew. The responsibility of... A, now, how, how soon after you started your flights over there in England to Europe did you become a lead crew? I think about the tenth mission or so. Uh, we had a very good pilot and co-pilot. They were instructors in the, in the States before they were sent over. And I was good enough so that they uh, uh, <laughs> 
thought I could cope with it. And so we gradually were given increased responsibilities. We started out as deputy lead, which would be uh, a crew that would uh, only take over the lead of a squadron if, if the lead crew became disabled or uh, couldn't do their job. And then we would become a squadron lead, and then we would uh, advance to a group lead where we would lead the three squadrons. And then as we got experience, we became uh, wing lead. And since uh, the wings took turns uh, leading the division, the first, second, and third division of the Air Force, uh, it w they would become, we became wing and division lead. If it was our turn, we would lead the division. And then at one one mission, or our division, uh, there was a, I can't remember what, what the, I guess it was bad weather and uh, serious uh, losses. Uh, our division became the, the lead division, so for a short time we became Air Force lead. <laughs> That's a huge responsibility. Yeah. What, um, what group was your division named? I mean, quite often. My group, group. was the 452nd Bomb Group. Heavy. And what do you mean by heavy? That means that we flew uh, the, the biggest bombers that were available, the B-17s or B-24s. In our case, it was, case was the Flying Forts B-17s. And then there were three squadrons that we, different squadrons were assigned to. We started out with the 730th Squadron, and then we went to the 730, 731st, which was the lead squadron. And uh, so, we, we weren't Air Force lead very long because the, the big ranking officers, when they got uh, back on, on track, or they wanted to take over the... <laughs> because the, it was prestigious, wasn't it? Oh, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. How, many flight, how many combat flights did you participate in? 25. That's a lot, isn't it? Yeah. Considered a lot? Yeah. Well, it seemed like a, a lot. And do, during that time, um, did you keep score, so to speak? Did your group keep score? Well, our, our success on bombers was always rated by uh, photos and by, uh, by damage assessment. And uh, we were told that we did a good job or, or that we, many times because of the bad weather, and we got a, an awful lot of that, we had to, uh, uh, rely upon uh, not our Norden bomb site, which is very accurate, but upon uh, other factors by which the bombs would be dropped. Uh, uh, electronic signals, which would signal when we should be over a certain city. So unfortunately, we were just, many times, we were just bombing big cities. You didn't know quite where because you couldn't Yeah, we weren't see. really bombing the marshalling yards that we were trying to hit, but we were causing damage to, to German cities. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, to probably many civilians. Of course it was to many civilians. And many times it might be because of uh, uh, the weather, we would have to bomb secondary targets so we, we couldn't get to the primary, or even targets of opportunity we would find a, a German city and identify it, and we would bomb that, at least to get rid of our bombs for some uh, uh, harm to the enemy, and, and you don't want to uh, land with a full bomb load either. While on these missions, were you confronted with enemy aircraft also? No. Well, maybe one, one time or so. Uh, there had been so much uh, bombing of German uh, oil supplies, Merseburg and so forth, and those were, were very dreadful missions. That's where that crew that we first roomed with got their baptism of fire. They suffered great damage, and, and uh, uh, you could see that they were suffering from combat fatigue. Mm -hmm. And the pilot was no longer able to, to fly, so they, they got a substitute pilot from the uh, 
Canadian Air Force who flew as their pilot when they got back into. Did you have any close calls? Yes, we had uh, uh, quite a few close calls. Uh, we used to come back with the aircraft uh, uh, full of holes uh, on a few occasions. And, uh, but the, the worst close calls were from near mid-air collisions. With, we, mid -air with, collisions. with your own aircraft? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one in particular was uh, getting back to the base when the windshield had iced up. It was bad weather. And I uh, had uh, gone off of the intercom to, to check the radio compass to make sure of our location. And uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, when I got back on, uh, on intercom, I heard this screaming, uh, pull up, pull up. No. I'm sorry to be kind of sentimental. Don't be sorry. But it was uh, uh, just at the, at the last moment, uh, uh, the waste gunner looking out of the, out of the windows, and the engineer could see, but the pilot and co-pilot couldn't because of the icing. And this is B-17 coming right at us, and they were screaming, pull up, pull up. And, uh, we did, and just missed, uh, of course, that ship. And on another training flight, when we were uh, flying in the clouds, an aircraft came up and just missed us uh, in the clouds. And and on my and on my training, one of my training flights in pilot training, I was flying along, and. All of a sudden, a twin, this is in a primary Sturman biplane, a twin engine aircraft came right at me and I was able to pull up. Uh, and this, this aircraft was on an instrument training flight, evidently. It never, it never changed its course or anything. They probably never saw me. <laughs> they had their windows closed and they were supposed to be looking out for other aircraft, but. Uh, when you were on the B-17 and you, you don't ever apologize for, for your feelings. Um, thinking back to that incident, it obviously has stayed with you. What were your feelings like after, once your pilot and co-pilot were able to pull up? Was there quiet in the plane or not enough time for quiet because you all had things to do? Well, in that particular mission, it was still hairy getting, getting down. Yeah, uh, and, and because of enemy fire or no, because of the a, weather. It was because of the weather and mm -hmm. because we probably were getting low on gas mm -hmm. and uh, and fatigued, and there, all the aircraft were milling around. You know, some of them damaged, and trying to, or some of them was wounded on, trying to get in. And unfortunately, after one of those maximum efforts, uh, this crew. This was before we became a lead crew, but the crew that was rooming with us and had this pilot uh, that uh, couldn't fly had the substitute pilot, and they, they kept their, their own co-pilot, and they kept most of the enlisted members, the gunners and their radio operator and the engineer. but. The navigator and bombardier of that crew were assigned to other crews uh, which needed their expertise. And so they were not on that, uh, this, this old decrepit airplane that that crew was assigned to fly. And so when they got back, and when we got back, uh, we landed, and the navigators were always debriefed. They were asked to describe the weather and what they saw and what what happened and so forth, and especially as we became a lead crew. 
But in any case, uh, I would, didn't get back to the hut until, uh, this is going to be difficult. <clears throat> well, until the rest of the crews are back. And, uh, and this uh, co-pilot that was on this other crew was a great friend of their navigator and of me. We used to go to, to mass together in the evening quite often, and we used to joke together. And he's a, a fellow with a very, very nice fellow. His name was Al. And so we got back, and uh, the navigator and bombardier were there. And, uh, and so I looked around and said, where's Al? And uh, <laughs> That's all right. Take your time. And Mike says, Al's dead. Uh, uh, he had been hit? No, when they got back with this <clears throat> beat up old B-17, they, uh, they missed their first approach and landing. They had to take off, or they had to give it power again and go around again. And in going around, something happened to that uh, OB-17. And they crash landed, and they were all killed except the tail gunner. Terrible, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. And he was your friend. Well, Al was my particular friend, Al Marla. Having something like that happen, what was it like for you to have to go back up in your own plane again soon after? Didn't mind that. You didn't? I didn't mind it. Uh, what I really minded was the, uh, well, I shouldn't say I didn't mind it. What, what I really did, hated, though, was the, the responsibility of, of doing my job and the difficulty that occurred because in, uh, in flying formations, especially as a lead crew, why the airspeed would change and the, uh, the headings would, could not be kept constant. The pilot couldn't maintain the headings, which to do navigation, you have to know what average heading you're on and know what effect the wind has had on you to figure out what course your aircraft has maintained to know where you're going and also what speed you're, you're making on over the ground in order to know what time you're going to get there. And these became quite variable because of the necessity for uh, changes in uh, throttle settings and so forth and adjustments to, to maintain tight formations. It was dangerous flying, especially in bad weather, to fly close to other aircraft. And uh, it was a, a real stress on the pilot and co-pilot to keep it up. And of course, because of the the variables, I was always worried about whether I was doing the job right, and especially when we became a lead crew. Mm -hmm. And we did have a radar operator then who helped me, because if, uh, if I would become somewhat uh, uh, unsure of my uh, wind uh, that I was using for calculations or my observations, I could check with my radar operator, and he would give me a uh, a, a fix based upon the distance and direction from some landmark that he could identify with his radar. At the same token, he would ask me to give him an approximate dead reckoning so he could figure out where he was and then identify uh, his uh, locations from the landmarks. Uh, but uh, I always worried about getting over some big city and suffering uh, great flak damage uh, as our roommate crew did. Uh, Pop Jennings, the navigator on the, on the, the, roommate, the, the crew that shared officer's quarters with us, uh, got, his, uh, uh, got our group over Wiesbaden and we suffered a lot of losses because of that and he uh, he lamented that. Felt real bad, even even though it, uh, uh, 
it wasn't any mistake really he made. He just didn't have the right information. Now you've mentioned that occasionally you came back with holes yeah. in your aircraft. Yeah. During that period of time, was anyone in your crew ever injured? Well, uh, not, not, let's see now. No, not in my crew. In, in the, the, the crew that we were flying with, one was injured. And when I substituted as a navigator, for a time, our crew didn't fly missions. I, I, that's another anachronism in here. But because of a little a mistake that our pilot made in letting my co our, our co-pilot land too far down the runway on a training flight and go off into the mud, it wasn't my pilot's fault because it was an icy runway and the tail wheel wouldn't unlock. But in any case, they gave my pilot the 104th article of war which is a little reprimand for allowing the co-pilot to land too far down the runway. And even though our pilot was a, one of the best, uh, he was given this reprimand. And because of a regulation that you couldn't be, receive a promotion after you'd flown a certain number of missions, they held back on our crew and a few flights so that, and that was a very lucky break uh, because he could have been killed on some of those missions. Sure. But uh, we, we did miss a, a couple of flights. And during that time, uh, when they needed a navigator or a bombardier for some other crews that, that, that lacked because of injury or sickness or uh, casualty, a navigator, uh, then I would fly with that crew and on one of those, on one of those flights, uh, the bombardier uh, suffered an injury because of a flak hitting a plexiglass which hit his eye. Luckily, it wasn't the missile itself that it hit him, but it did damage his eye severely, and he was just barely able to, uh, to drop his bombs, uh, and, and he dropped them based upon when the other aircraft dropped theirs. Uh, but uh, Now, I've been told by others who have interviewed with us that it's very close quarters in those aircraft. Did you find that also? Yes, it was close. Uh, 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 the bombardier was a pain in the neck. <laughs> uh, uh, but he, he had the ideal seat up there in the, in the nose. But when he'd move around, sometimes I, I, I had hardly enough room for my charts. I had to spread my charts out, and I had to, to draw my courses and my uh, fixes and so forth. And it seemed as though that uh, uh, it was always close and uh, cold. <laughs> uh, now, when you mentioned that you were on 25 combat flights, over how long a period of time? Well, it was from the time we got there, which is, gee, I still didn't give you that date. February. I think of you said February of 43, 40, I think. Uh, 44. 44, yeah, February 4, yeah, that's right. No, uh, February 45. February, February 45, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So how, how through what, till to when? Till June of 45. That's a lot of. Yeah, fun. and actually one of those missions was not, not exactly a combat mission. One of the missions was uh, dropping chaff, which was just, just as dangerous as, well, not quite. Yeah, it would be just as dangerous except that we weren't flying in, in formation. And we what were, is chaff? That's uh, tin foil or aluminum foil. Our aircraft would be loaded with uh, bales of, uh, of this stuff, which, and we would fly before the mission. Various aircraft were assigned to do that. And we would fly uh, uh, the same route over the target area and push these bales of foil out so that it would disrupt the German radar for uh, 
measuring the altitude and direction of the actual bombers when they came later. So, uh, and the odd thing about that flight, odd and, and terrible, was that while we were doing it, another B-17 from another group came up close by, flying close by, and uh, we could tell, it was, of course, we all had our distinctive markings on our tails, so the 452nd had a particular stripe. This aircraft was, was a, another group, and all of a sudden, they were, it got a direct hit and disintegrated. It, I didn't see it happen, but the rest of the crew said, my God, they just, they just blew up. And I don't recall now, I don't, I don't think that they were able to ever see any parachutes. I think that, that uh, because they probably had, they might have, they might have had bombs on. I don't know, or, or they, I don't know what they, what they were doing up there. But uh, they suddenly appeared, and then all of a sudden, yeah, they, they flew were along with us a short interval, and then they were blown to kingdom come. A mystery, which uh, I don't, we we were never told what happened. Yeah. yeah, if anyone ever knew why that aircraft was up, they certainly shouldn't have been up in that, in that area unless they were doing something that required doing. Mm -hmm. Because we knew that anti-aircraft were firing at us. And uh, we, uh, they probably weren't quite as, uh, as uh, angry at us because we weren't dropping bombs. <laughs> right. But yeah. they were still, drop, still shooting. Uh, so okay. after, is there one particular, I mean, you've told some remarkable and heart-wrenching stories here. Is there any other particular mission that sticks out in your mind as either a really good thing or something that has stayed with you for many, many years? Well, that terrible mission when we got back in the hours. That had to be heart-wrenching for you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I do remember, it almost seems as though it was Christmas Eve. After a mission, we had a party. And we went to the, to the club, the officer's club, and they had invited a bunch of women from London. And a lot of them were, uh, you should pardon the expression, Piccadilly commandos. <laughs> And, and, and explain that expression, if you would. Uh, they were uh, commercial girls. Okay. Street mm -hmm. girls, mm -hmm. lovely girls. And uh, but I had the most fun. Uh, the, the crew and, and my friends uh, uh, thought that I was kind of naive about women and stuff. Uh, uh, some of them were much more while that I, at that time, in fact, made a practice of, of getting everything they could. And I, I had my, <laughs> my do's and don'ts. But just for a laugh, uh, they, they took this particular girl, Sally. I, I was having a good time dancing and so forth, wonderful time. And they sat around my lap and said, there now, tell, <laughs> tell, tell a guy what he's missing. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, how old were you? Mid twenties. Uh, let's see. I, I guess I yeah, twenty four, something like that. I guess. What was 21. was that about the average age of your flight crew also? Well, m m most of them were older than me. The pilots and co-pilot. Oh, the co-pilot was a little younger. The pilot was quite a bit older. The engineers and the enlisted men, most of those were quite a bit older. Especially the ball turret gunner. He had been a commercial pilot in civilian life, but he became the ball turret gunner. And he only flew missions with us until we became a, ball, a, a lead crew, because when we became a lead crew, we no longer had a ball turret gun. We had a radar ball, and we had a radar operator who would become an, another member of our crew. So 
Rekhoff no longer flew with us, but he was he was considerably older, and considerably. I said, well, he and the engineer ran close seconds as to who was the wildest, <laughs> but they they were heavy drinkers, very heavy, uh, and uh, heavy uh, love makers. <laughs> Because they could back then, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, right. tell me, um, did you have a certain crew who would take care of your particular plane, or were there different mechanics all no, the time? No, we didn't have a particular plane. You had in, different in, planes all different the time? Planes. In the okay. old days, crews were assigned to a, to a specific plane. Mm -hmm. uh, but in our day, and by the time we got there, we were just given, sometimes you might get a repeat plane, but we were given a plane that was in the best shape for the mission that, that, that was pending. And close to the end of your combat duty, had you gotten um, a higher ranking? Yeah. Because you said it had been held back a bit because yeah. of overshooting the runway. Yeah. At this point, back in, let's say, the, the end of June there, what was your ranking then? I had become a first lieutenant. And I uh, uh, was kind of a pain in the neck. Well, no, I shouldn't say that. But, but I had fun because I uh, outranked my pilot uh, and some of the other members who, who actually had seniority. But because they were uh, held back because of the 104th, uh, they were still second lieutenant, and I <laughs> was a first. Uh, of course, on the aircraft, the pilot was still boss. And... Uh, and I never lorded over any of the crew, not the enlisted men or anything, and never uh, pulled rank. Of course, I, I, I gave them the instructions for what I had to have done. But uh, oh, I, was, I was one of the boys. And, uh, you, was, you worked well together, all of you, yeah. for the most part. Yeah. And as we became more, more experienced and more responsible, we got better aircraft, too. And that was nice. What, um, do you feel, you've, you've mentioned that your, um, the pilot was an excellent man. Do you feel, for the most part, that officers were good leaders? Yes. You I, being an officer also. The, the but. combat officers, I, I felt, were. Uh, with some exceptions in the, in the command structure of the base, uh, the, uh, the commanding officer uh, made a mistake uh, during a during a all kind of a uh, it's supposed to be a training flight I suppose but actually it was an, exc an excursion flight for him that he took off uh, before the uh, oh, a gyroscopic compass had had time to erect and give a correct heading. So when I gave him a heading, which was a correct heading, he took it based upon the gyrocopic compass and, and got way off course. And luckily, it was a nice day that day, and we could tell, he could see, he could see where he was. So when he said, uh, when he saw that we were going off course, he says, uh, uh, Paul to Navigator, where are we? And of course, I, I hadn't paid any attention with such a a breeze. I knew we were just going to go a short distance. I knew my heading would get him to there, regardless of the wind. So I looked on. I said, "Well, gee, we're so." He said, "Never mind." He said, "I know where we are." So when we got back to the base, uh, the colonel said to the pilot, uh, "What about this navigator Shrag here? Uh, he uh, he gave us a, a faulty heading, and uh, and I, and Baker defended me. He said, "I said, I know Shrag is good. He's, he." Uh, on our training, training flights, he's gotten great ratings in celestial training and other things. I, I know he's good. Uh, and this guy never acknowledged that uh, it was because of his not following the, pres the prescribed procedure. He was in a, you know, a big shot. He the commanding officer. He's going to take off in a hurry to hell with the, <laughs> the time for the gyroscopic compass to, to come up to speed. And then in our, on our trip home, uh, we flew in, in his aircraft. He had his own aircraft that was faster because it didn't have any guns. 
and it was equipped with a Loran uh, uh, equipment, which give, gave you much more accurate fixes, which he didn't know about, which I didn't know about until I discovered it and used it. But on the way back, he saw some ships going in a different direction, and he started questioning uh, the pilot. He says, you know, he says, I'm, I'm a little concerned. Do you think he knows uh, what he's doing and giving me these courses? Because we were depending uh, primarily upon meteorological winds to, to uh, fly our great circle route. It, it was constantly changing heading to, to get the shortest distance. And we could shoot sun lines, which would give us a line of position as far as course, if it was perpendicular to our course, or as far as speed if we were the other way. But uh, we didn't have real good aids to navigation. And uh, so uh, it, we, we did divert, you know, we, we didn't all wind up in the same, uh, following each other, we didn't do that. So he had some justification for worrying a little bit. That's a long, deep ocean. Sure. <laughs> but as it turned out, using that radar, they came in perfectly uh, on course and on the time. And as we got close to land, why uh, the group navigator, knowing that I had worked uh, hard during all this flight, took over for me. And uh, so he took over the navigator's duties and he just used pilotage. And when he got to this small island, right on course and right on time, why he, you know, gave me a big uh, uh, Pat on the back, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. And when we landed, this, uh, this Colonel Chuck uh, uh, came up and said, uh, uh, and I don't want to be sentimental about this, but he said, that's the best navigation job I ever saw. And I said, thank you, sir. And I still <laughs> resented him. <laughs> yeah. Quick to blame yeah. someone else, Because he right? didn't know that I had the luck to to have this extra good equipment to sure. Loran to get my exact fixes. And uh, sure. we would have come in all right, but this way is, is perfect. Right on target. Yeah. Were you ever wounded yourself? No, no. You're very fortunate. Um, you mentioned that you would hear, once, once you were in the thick of it all, did you hear about other situations in the war, both in Europe and then... Um, in the Pacific also? Were you hearing anything yes, we, about them? And how did you hear these news? Well, we got news broadcasts, radio broadcasts, and we got the information from our, our own uh, uh, higher ranking people. And we got the, the Yank publications and up front with Bill Malden and different publications. So we kept abreast and usually it was good news and a, large, a lot of it was probably propaganda. But in any case, we, we kind of kept track of the news. And then we would meet with other crews sometimes on when we had uh, uh, passes to London. You'd and hear so, more information and then. And sometimes we would hear explosions too, unfortunately, of, a, of aircraft on neighboring bases that didn't make it off on takeoff. Uh, it, was, it was quite a job to take off with a full bomb load and a full gas especially for the B-24s, which had a, a high wing loading. And so sometimes we'd hear a, a boom in the distance and kind of feel the ground shake, and we knew that some, some aircraft went in. That was usually on takeoff while we were assembling. Did you ever feel, quite often as a unit, you know, you, you made friends with your core group, did you ever feel a little superstitious about helping out another group, filling in as the navigator? Did you ever have concerns about doing that? I didn't like it as well, because I didn't, I didn't know these other crew members. But uh, uh, I, I, as a matter of fact, I, uh, when we, when, when we, before we take off, I, we would check out the intercoms, and every one of the crew would, would check in. And being a smart aleck, why, uh, when it came my turn, I, uh, I got on the intercom and uh, I sang a little ditty, which, which I can't sing for you now. 
Not appropriate, but, huh? <laughs> but, I, uh, but there was a silence, and I heard this guy saying, who the hell is that? Who's that? Who the hell is that? <laughs> I'm the navigator and signed to, to go with it this time. <laughs> but uh, we had fun. Once you finished up these combat flights, what did you do after that? Well, if we were lucky, we had a party. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was only once, once in a while. But we would be debriefed and get an extensive debriefing as lead navigators. And we would still have uh, recurring training flights. Our bombardier would, 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 uh, would uh, have assigned practice bombing runs, you're dropping uh, practice bombs on, on targets to see how well he, he would do with his bomb site. And I would have navigation practices wherein I would practice uh, assembling the formation. Uh, you see, you had to leave our base with the group assembled behind you uh, on course and on time within a minute or two and within just a few degrees. You, couldn't, you can't turn these big formations fast, so you had to get things lined up and in time uh, gradually as, you, as you're flying around. And so we navigators had a procedure whereby we would be able to calculate uh, positions and corrections so that we could either slow down or speed up our, pro our progress around the, this radio buncher and so that we could get our, our crews uh, into the approximately correct heading to, to leave for uh, going on to join up with the other crews and the other wings and so forth. And that, so we had to practice those type of flights. Uh, and I worried about those things because uh, uh, it's too much responsibility. Once you were finished, how did you know you were finished? What happened when you know, knew that you were going elsewhere? Was the war over or did you get sent home? What was the, the, the next step? Well, the war in the, Pacific, in the Pacific was still going on. But well, as far as we were concerned, uh, we were <laughs> riding high, and we flew back, and uh, were given a, uh, a leave of uh, how many days of that? I don't know, but uh, uh, the world was our oyster. Do you feel you were properly trained and equipped for what you faced? Yes, I think so. Uh, as, as we flew, I, we, we got better equipment as we got more responsibility, and, and we would like to have had that equipment on all the flights, but it's just that they couldn't supply the best equipment to, to all of us. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, that we were well equipped and trained. Do you think your plane was equal to, better than, better. or inferior to better. what you... Better? Yeah. Better? Our bombers are better and our fighter protection got to be better. When and where were you discharged? Well, I was discharged as far as, as active duty. I was given a 30-day terminal leave from Fort Dix, New Jersey, and sent home for 30 days where I was still, you know, actually on duty but on leave. And what was your rank back then? I was a first lieutenant then. And so I was actually discharged from Syracuse, New York. And what t were some of the decorations that you came home with? I got the D uh, DFC, which is the D Distinguished Flying Cross, and the uh, oak, uh, Air Medal with three oak leaf clusters. Now, why three? Explain that. Because for every six missions we flew successfully, and did a good job, we got a, an air medal. And so if we did it again, we got a, another oak leaf cluster. So we got three oak leaf clusters in the accumulation of successful missions. And the DFC was for 
uh, doing a, a good job as lead crew. And we also got three battle campaign ribbons for the time that we were there. They assigned different uh, identifications to different periods of time. And, we got, and we also got what they called a ruptured duck, which is a, a medal that all veterans were given, I guess, at the end of hostilities. <laughs> what was it like? How did you feel coming home? Uh, like on top of the world. And when you came home, did you discuss any of the missions and the issues that occurred with family or friends? Not very much. I talked a little bit about that with my very close cousin, Wayne, who, who didn't have to go because he had a, a, uh, a job which uh, required his staying in the States. After you were home, did you join any unit of the military reserve? Yeah, I, I joined the uh, Air Force Reserve. And how long were you in the Air Force Reserve? About 27 years, I think. And was that um, something that kept you in one area? Were you back in New York at that time? Well. I don't think I joined the, I joined the reserve, but I didn't participate in reserve activities, I don't believe, until we were mo moved down to uh, Rutledge, Pennsylvania, and I joined the group that flew out of uh, uh, Dover, Delaware, uh, a navigation uh, training group. And then when my job was moved to Columbus, Ohio, I was able to get, uh, that's my civilian job. I was able to get assigned to uh, Natick, Massachusetts. I worked for the Army as a civilian. I got signed up there, and I was able to join another reserve training group at Hanscom Field in, uh, in Massachusetts. So there was two locations where we had this training primarily Dover, Delaware, and, and Hanscom. What was your ranking when you retired from the reserve? When I retired from, I was a lieutenant colonel, I guess, at that time. As a reservist, were you um, on alert or on, did you have any dealings during the Korean conflict? Not, not active dealings. We were trained primarily to be available in case they had to uh, commandeer the civilian airlines to uh, transport troops and so forth because they were not equipped with navigators. They, they were not uh, given navigators. So we had to maintain proficiency and gain new proficiency to act as navigations for overseas flights, uh, update our celestial navigation, enhance our Loran and our radar and our pressure pattern and various new techniques. And we flew uh, missions uh, continue, well, continually every month uh, to, to make sure that we had that proficiency. And we also did uh, uh, two-week active duty tours where we would fly uh, overseas and train with uh, uh, for overseas flights and uh, fly practice missions over there or fly uh, early warning missions down at uh, Camp, Camp what well, used to be Camp Miles Standish was the Army name. There's an Air Force base down there too. I can't think of that. Name but, but in, Where, Cape, down in Cape Cod, Otis yeah. Air Force Base? Yeah, that's it. Otis. That's it, mm -hmm. yeah, good for you. <laughs> Did you join any veterans organizations? Not until late in life when I, uh, I found out that it was pleasant to stop at the VFW with a friend of mine and have some beers while we were singing with the Golden Ears, and I liked that group, and so I joined them. And the Golden Ears is... A uh, the Natick Senior Center Singing Group. 
and Jack Pennington was a VFW member, and he he would take me there, and we'd have a few beers on the way home, and and I liked the the group, so I joined them. And have you received any veterans benefits, such as hospitalization or the GI Bill or insurance? Yes, I utilized the GI Bill in obtaining our first mortgage, well, obtaining our mortgage for the first house we bought. Is what I'm trying to say, and I also. Uh, what about for, did you finish up college while you were in the service or did you no, finish it after? after, after. And did you use the GI Bill for that at no, all? Mm -hmm. No, I didn't use that for that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, because I was a resident of New York State, I got a low tuition at the State College of New York. I, I should finish too. I, I used the hospitalization benefits of the uh, Air Force after I qualified for it with my reserve completion. And while they didn't give me what they promised, that is complete medical coverage for me and my family, including dental care, they still have given me low cost medical care and a small degree of dental care. And also they pay me, or they paid me for my training flights to, uh, and my active duty uh, flights and they pay me now for my retirement. Not much, but it helps. <laughs> Do you attend any reunions of your old unit? Yes, I, uh, I went to a reunion of the 452nd Bomb Group where I rescued my ball turret gunner from a, a, a too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> and I have reunions with my crew members quite a bit. Wonderful time. How do you feel, or do you feel in any way that your military service affected your life? Oh, very much. Uh, here's. It's uh, the last here's, page um, that yeah. I'm questioning. Yeah. I got glasses here someplace. There. They're right there on uh, the oh, corner oh, of the you. chair. Yeah. You're welcome. You see why? I, uh, need a woman in the house. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, uh, I reflected on this, and uh, so... Halfway down is the question. Uh, I thought that the, that the Air Force, that the military experience was one of the most important experiences in my life. And uh, Do you feel in some way it affected your life? Yes, it certainly did, because it, it gave me a a sense of pride and a sense of uh, accomplishment, maturity, and sophistication and confidence. Uh, and that has helped me in the succeeding years of my life. Uh, it helped provide the self-assurance uh, that I needed to, uh, to woo the uh, widowed girl that I had just barely known before I left the service and whose style I liked quite a bit, and who was still around when I came back to the school, and gave me that uh, enough uh, self-assurance to woo her and uh, have her for her. Uh, How many years were you married? 60 years. 60 years of wedded bliss. Looking back, you did mention a couple of funny things, but is there any one experience or memorable character or humorous experience, something that you'd like to share with us that you can share with us? Oh, there were, oh, just so many funny guys. One guy that I do remember kind of in particular was the, the bombardier of the crew that shared, the, the lead bombardier that shared the, the hut with us, uh, who drank very heavily with his, with his navigator and uh, they always uh, used up their pay long before the next pay was due and they'd come home from the officers club after it closed uh, singing bringing in the sheaves we'd hear them coming up this long <laughs> walk from the club <laughs> lit <laughs> and singing and this bombardier uh, he was a he was a real nice fella he was one of the few that was loyal to his girlfriend at home. 
And the others, uh, I can't uh, give much credit to, especially that navigator who was married and, and my pilot who was married. Well, I shouldn't, be meant to, I shouldn't be saying these things. But anyway, this fellow would have these funny expressions. Like I say, he drank an awful lot and he joked a lot. And he would sometimes say, why, when I get mad, I'm a wildcat, <laughs> true wildcats. I'm a whole damn zoo. <laughs> and they're just fucking, you know, when I, when I get mad, I usually get knocked on my... <laughs> so he, he, was a, he was a joy. And then a funny, a funny situation is the one where, where one of the crew put a, a flare in the stove of the hut where we were, where we lived. And we used to enjoy getting toast, getting bread and, and butter from the mess hall and making toast to snack on. And so we would toast this toast over the stove. And so, so one of the fellows was toasting against toast, you know, and watching it carefully with, with the lid off the stove. And somebody had put the flare in. All of a sudden, this flare went off. And the fire shot up and knocked the toast in the air. And this fellow fell backwards. His chair overturned, and all of us actually <laughs> went she, over A big cow. surprise and yeah. fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, you well, had to have humor, didn't you? Oh, and because we did there have. was so much tension besides uh, that. And we had so much wit that was uh, available, like the like the young brother of uh, of Benny Goodman, the great. His younger brother was in the, one of our training flights, and during a particular time when it was either Christmas or just next to it, why well, he'd come up with this song: "Happy holiday, happy holiday," and of course that's the way we felt. <laughs> <laughs> holiday baloney. Above he, all, is there a thought, an incident, or something you'd like to share with us, with your family, or with others who might be viewing this tape? Well, I remember, on particular, the, the good feeling I had at the cheerful uh, reunion with my dad when I got back the first time I saw him after uh, coming back. And, and also, the nice feelings I got from letters from uh, relatives, aunts and so forth, that I hadn't been particularly close to, but who uh, made me feel good and, and worthwhile because of their uh, communications. And of course, my mother was so wonderful in writing to me. So it made me feel loved. Is there anything we haven't asked you or an additional comment you'd like to leave with us? Well, oh yes, I had some down here. Life has been wonderful and it still is, but I wish we could get back the feelings of purpose that we had during this great period. Well, Guy A. Schrag, we want to thank you for sharing mm -hmm. an amazing story with us. Your memory is right on. Your humor is wonderful. Your emotions show that you really, really care, and we're thankful for you coming in today. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry I'm a little too sentimental. That's okay. But uh, thank you.